welcome back, or if it's your first time, welcome to another episode of Seller Performance Solutions. I'm Leah McHugh, and with me is Mr. E-Commerce Chris, Chris McCabe. We are talking today about something that we've been noticing for a while, but seems to be happening more. And to me, it's just kind of confusing, to be honest. What we're seeing is a lot of sellers are being deactivated and deactivated with a dispute-only appeal path. However, the reason for the deactivation is because of a specific listing or a specific series of listings. And yet Amazon doesn't remove the listings. <laughs> so they think that the infraction is so bad that they want to remove the seller. And the only way that they could possibly ever get reinstated would be to dispute that they ever violated any policies. However, the policy violating listing is still active and visible on their website and often still has other sellers on it. Right. The brand owner hasn't been punished, but a reseller has been punished, which yeah. makes no sense. The one I saw recently was misbranded items and the resellers are still there. The listing is still up. And if you're on LinkedIn for even five minutes, you can see other people saying, why am I being punished for X, Y, Z? Here's a bunch of examples of other people doing it. And oh, by the way, the listing is still there. And they kind of, I mean, this is something that came up at the Accelerate conference here in Seattle last week. They kind of don't act like they're aware that this is happening or they don't really have an explanation waiting for that. So even speaking with people in person, you can book these appointments with Amazonians when you're here for the conference. They'll look at it with you. They'll understand what you're saying. It's not difficult to understand. They won't have an explanation. They'll typically say something like, I'll have to look into this further and get back to you. And a couple of the people who said that to us haven't gotten back to us yet. And it's already the next week. So we're kind of wondering <laughs> if there's really nothing to say because there's no viable explanation for why that's happening. Well, so, I mean, I generally assume it's just the right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing when it comes to things like this at Amazon. I think what's surprising to me is that a lot of these sorts of takedowns are because there is a legal aspect to it. So Amazon's trying to minimize their risk <laughs> and yet they're not actually removing the listing that is posing the risk to them. They're just removing a seller. So that's yeah. the part that I find most confusing. Like I assume it's just oversight, but it's just strange to me that particularly at the moment where they seem very risk averse around well, this sort of thing. You get these non sequitur answers where they talk <laughs> about another part of like, well, the seller might've been suspended for something else. No, they're suspended for exactly this. <laughs> right. So I know you're casting about for additional reasons. This is something else that we'll have to talk about another episode. When you poke and prod and finally get somebody higher up in the company to come back, sometimes they say, well, there's actually several violations that this seller is guilty of. You know, this is after you've appealed a couple of times. It's really only about one thing. Well, but even if that were the case, that doesn't change the fact that yeah. the enforcement action was because there was something wrong with that listing. And yet that listing isn't being corrected and isn't being removed in the course of their action. Right. Which makes the action look bogus and unsubstantiated. So of course you're disputing it, but then at least in a couple of the cases I've saw, then they reject the dispute. So sometimes they reject the dispute because they say, you haven't given us evidence that we made a mistake, but the evidence is live on the site. So maybe they just don't want to admit that they made a mistake. Or maybe well, they I don't, don't want to take all these other sellers down. I mean, maybe they just don't want to punish a group of people. But I think that's the problem so, is that them leaving the listing on their site isn't actually proof that the listing isn't violating their policy. Right. Well, the dispute path problem is just getting worse because no one can make up their minds what an acceptable dispute is, whether it's disputing that Amazon made a mistake entirely, they took the wrong action from the get go, or whether you're you know, disputing it because of the situation we just described. So the other implication here is that you can make one listing mistake and then be suspended for listing policy violations. And then unless you can prove that you never made any listing mistakes, right. never sell again. Yes. Because almost all of the sellers I've talked to with this situation, it's their first time being punished for anything. So certainly their first suspension, but they're taking the whole account down. And I think this goes back to the whole concept from early 2024. They decided to suspend people for restricted products violations and not just suspend the ACE and suspend the whole account. 
but it's weird because I will see other accounts where it'll have hundreds of restricted product violations and the account is still up. Yeah. And then there are other accounts that have had one or two restricted product violations and then the entire account goes down. Certainly some of those are because the seller did stupid things after they <laughs> received or the, the restricted yeah. or, or they try to change facts <laughs> about the product to mm -hmm. make it look like it's not a restricted product. But right. outside of that, I have also seen a number of sellers where it is just a couple of restricted product violations that takes the whole account down. Meanwhile, other accounts have hundreds of them. And, and it's not even like it's different kinds of restricted products. I've seen some right. where it's the exact same kind of restricted product, but I don't know what the internal, I mean, it could just be down to the individual investigator that looked at it, I guess. But it just seems like there isn't a very specific internal metric for when an account is removed well, versus when the listing is removed. Presumably those are lower volume sellers. So if they get one or two or three. Not always though. That's their volume is low, then it sticks out like a sore thumb. If it's a high volume seller and they have a handful of these, then they kind of blends in with their background in terms of account health. I don't know. I've seen some large accounts. Policy violations, it's not supposed to matter how many you get per hundred or a thousand orders. It's supposed to be, no, you're violating the policy, which means you're a bad player in the marketplace and you have to be dealt with. So they're also straying from their mission statement in terms of the theory of how enforcement is conducted. And then I think you have trouble getting answers from Amazonians about these types of actions because they're mistakes and they can't explain them or justify them because they don't want to justify repeated mistakes by employees who maybe the case I saw, maybe they were supposed to suspend the brand. Maybe they were supposed to take all those other resellers on that listing down and they just picked one. Mm -hmm. But imagine how fishy that looks. Right. Almost as if the brand or some other party, let's say, singled out this one seller. And that's what sellers, you know, that's what undermines their faith in enforcement. Mm -hmm. Whenever you feel singled out, all the years we've been doing this, people are always complaining to us, why are we being singled out? Well, in some cases, like this, they actually were singled out. We can prove they were singled out. The question is why? Right. I think and... for me, the largest part, and I think this is the part that I talk to sellers the most about because there isn't really a good understanding about it, is that if Amazon warns you that one of the products that you're selling is a restricted product, if you're selling other products of the same type on different ASINs and Amazon hasn't warned you about those, it doesn't mean that they're fine with those. If they've warned you about one of them, you should be removing all of them from your account if Amazon is correct and they are restricted products because failing to remove them from your account makes it way more likely that they're going to come back and suspend your account. They consider a warning for an ASIN to be a warning for you to check all of your listings and make sure that they are in compliance with whatever policy that they warned you about. They're not going to warn you about every single ASIN <laughs> before they no. take down the account. I have this okay. conversation with sellers a lot where they're like, well, the other one's fine, so I'm just going to keep selling it. And that is putting a huge risk to your account. Yeah. And I know that they often don't sound as concerned as we hope they will when we have those conversations. But it's good news in that it's a warning shot and it gives you an right. opportunity sometimes to take these other listings down and to reduce the risk to the account, which is a, a slide for a presentation I was working on today, actually, because that, that is the silver lining in these types of problems. But it does, it is interesting that no one, I mean, especially at Accelerate, I had to sit down with a high level executive and I pointed this out. That's why we're talking about it today. And his answer was without, you know, naming names here. Well, we do everything we can to protect buyers. We have an obligation if we find these branding errors to take corrective action. And not every corrective action happens the same day at the same time, more or less, I think is what he was driving at. And so when you're sitting with somebody for 20 or 30 minutes, of course, it's like, well, it sounds like you're going to look into it and get back to us. But it has been five days. And I don't think they have a real answer for why well, that happened. Well, and at this point, it's been weeks that two the months. seller, the, yeah, right. Yeah. So the seller has been enforced against for two months and the listing itself is still active yeah. with other sellers. Yeah. And then you, as in kind of an exercise that we did, you researched the brand or tried to online and we found like nothing about, I mean, they are the easiest suspension case. There's no intellectual property complaint from the rights owner that owns what's being infringed against on that listing, but the brand is basically a phantom or a ghost and doesn't exist. I mean, that would have been an easy suspension. So they didn't take the brand owner down, 
they took down one out of a handful of resellers. And maybe you're not a reseller, you're a brand owner, and you're saying, why does this apply to me? But honestly, it just reinforces the notion that there's totally inconsistent decision making. So this could impact you on a future date in a different way, because there's no real rationale behind these types of enforcement actions. Yeah. And I'd also and... like to reiterate that because this is yet another conversation that I have almost every day with sellers, where they say, well, this other person's doing it, so it must be fine. You can't go off of what you see on the marketplace as being okay to do on the marketplace, because I've said it before on the podcast and I'm going to say it again. I can go to amazon.com and in about an average of two clicks, I can find a policy violation. Mm -hmm. So just because other people are doing it or just because all of your listings haven't been enforced against for a problem doesn't mean that there isn't a problem. Yes. And the added wrinkle here, of course, is that in the opaque world of copy and paste answers or phone calls with account health reps who don't know what we're talking about the last week was different, right? This is my first time going to Amazon Accelerate here in Seattle. And I've had opportunities to just take a few minutes, sit with somebody, walk through. This is what we found. They're not disputing anything I'm saying. They're agreeing with it. But then they seem like they're stuck about what to be done about it. So if they're at the higher echelons of the company and they're stuck, it means that you really have to get their attention in specific ways, probably more than once. Well, it also means um, don't waste your time in an appeal showing that other people are doing it. They are aware that they are inconsistent right. and they mm. are aware that that doesn't mean it's okay. That's my operating theory is yeah. that they hear this so often. Right. I assume they just immediately tune it out kind of like I do. <laughs> they, they kind of click into a different version of themselves because they don't think it's a solvable problem from the get go. Uh, which is interesting because a lot of the conversations that you have with people who've been at Amazon a while, they'll say, well, I can intervene only if there's a defined specific break in the process or breakdown of a process. Then I can point it out to whoever's in charge of that process. Sometimes we wonder if anyone's in charge of these things and say, this is where it was supposed to go a certain direction. This is where it went wrong. And you can do those things at a conference. You can actually have those types of conversations where you don't have them on the phone or on Zoom usually. Mm -hmm. So we'll see <laughs> in our follow-ups if that can be remedied, but coming in person and doing it at a high level in the executive ranks isn't going to do the trick then. Dear listener, Leah and I will have to come up with some other ideas and suggestions based on this intractable position where it's like, well, unless you can point out that the initial action we took was wrong, we're kind of not worried about the rest of this stuff, whether or not there's inconsistencies or paradoxes in enforcement. I think they've just kind of come to accept that. I mean, yeah, but it would be nice if they were also better at identifying <laughs> when they did do it incorrectly, because I have also had to escalate those where... Amazon was clearly incorrect and it still wasn't being reviewed properly at the yeah. seller performance level. Yeah. So I can come back next week with more of a roundup of Accelerate. I had a lot of notes I didn't have a chance to go through because I had a lot of follow-up meetings here this week. But yeah, we can go through that and we'll find the silver lining in some of these rather critical issues that we're seeing. The interesting thing about Accelerate is it's mid-September, right on the cusp of heading into October, November, you know. So some of the announcements they make are for next year, the AI stuff and all the things they're going to do are more like Q1. Mm. So you walk out of those convention centers sometimes thinking, oh, well, Q4 is happening pretty much right now. So how much of this is going to be applicable? So I gleaned what lessons I could and we'll come back to that next week. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.